Okay, we're recording. They're trying to keep it a secret, but people are finding it. I hear my hand and keep it registered. You're talking. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Okay. Okay, now we're going to have to go to the meeting to get out and do the family relation. Okay. Um, my, my dad and my husband's father. So they're in our state. Okay. Yeah. And the church members out there, it's, it's yeah. one building and four boys. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. What I'm telling you. One's on the other side of town now. <laughs> start well we'll get started hopefully we have a few more people join us today we have some missing as well but maybe they'll be joining us on thursday so welcome to the city of orem i am the community services manager here and i oversee the cdbg program and we welcome you to our regional commission meetings um, we'll just go around the room and introduce each other or you can introduce yourselves and who you're representing and then we'll turn the time over to jessica for some information and then I think we're going to do chair elections first. Oh, chair elections. We'll and do approved and approved minutes. Okay, we'll do that. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's start with the introductions. And I introduce myself. So Melissa. Hi, I'm Melissa McNally. I'm with Provo City. I'm over there at the grant that And I'm Heather Rollins from Provo City as well. I'm Jessica Delora with MAC, um, which is the Utah Utah and Tech City Program. I'm also with MAC. Um, I'm the program manager over the CDBG community and economic. And on my left, I'm at one city. My name is. Oh, Debbie Gorin. Debbie Gorin, you represent more here? No, MAC. I'll have to be quiet. <laughs> 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 Well, let's see. We're just going to introduce Okay. Yeah. I'm with Mag as well. I'm the community manager. Taylor. Good morning, I'm the mayor. Karen, I'm the advisory commission to the county's foreign councils. Look at the camera. Sorry for the lateness. I can't blame her with the number. Thank you, Martinez. I'm volunteer for a while. Well, welcome, everyone. I love when my past collides with my present, <laughs> Mr. Keller. Um, <laughs> so it's awesome. It's good to see you too. I love that. Well, next we need to have chair elections. So um, a few of you have done this before. Basically, we just need a chair and a, a vice chair um, that will just help us run the meeting. So they welcome people when they come, um, just kind of give them the time frame that they have and you know that kind of thing. So uh, Mayor Frost has done it in the past. Ken has done it in the past. So maybe some of the others have, but would anyone like to nominate themselves or be have us nominate you? Or not someone who's not here. Yeah. <laughs> Probably be good to have someone that's here right now. <laughs> Anyone willing? Yeah. Yes, I'll yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm the chair of our committee. Is there a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. He All loves being the chair. Do we have a second? second that. Oh, thanks, Fair. All in favor? Aye. Awesome. Okay. That took care of that. Okay. Well, now um, we've already actually approved these minutes a long time ago. We just have to review them to put them into record. So if we could just get a motion to put them into record. 
I'll make a motion to put in the record the March 1st, 2022 minutes. Second. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Awesome. Okay, now we'll let Jessica take over. I'm just going to go over the process, the materials that you have, and then we'll answer the questions. So um, for those of you that are new to our committee, welcome. Um, these three entities, Provo, Orm, and Utah County, all receive CPG funds separately from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, in the past, we were making all of our service providers in the region apply to each of the programs, interview, have awards, contracts reported to each of us, which is not very efficient, very difficult on the awardee, and also just more work for all of us that is unnecessary. So um, we have switched to doing this regional committee to vote on public services that impact the entire region. And so this body has representatives from each of the different uh, municipalities. And so together, this body will make um, funding recommendations. We'll finish that up on Thursday. And then those recommendations go back to approval for one city council, Provo City Council, and then our Utah County Committee. Um, so these are public services only. Um, we will be meeting tonight and Thursday night. So let's get to your package and we'll go over it with you. So this page here, when we completed, every five years we completed a consolidated plan. That's how to speak, but it basically is the time where um, we identify needs and priorities in the region. We look at um, market conditions, housing needs, um, all those kinds of things. And we do a lot of outreach to like, officials, business owners, the community, et cetera. And so these were the, um, the priorities, the top priorities identified through that process for the five year period. Just because something isn't on here doesn't mean it's not a priority, but these are your top top ones right here. So that can help you with your scoring applications, kind of figure out how high a priority you think it is. We also, of course, want you to bring your expertise and your knowledge of your community with that well. You should have a loose interview schedule here. We actually had a last minute cancellation at 505. Uh, she had COVID, just a positive thing. So we'll have a little snack break right there. Um, um, it's the Utah County Children's Justice Center. So we, they have been moved to Thursday at six o'clock. Um, so the next page you'll see here is the scoring sheet. This will look like all the green sheets that you also have in here. This is how we score and rank applications. So these first five are objective scoring that staff do, but you can see the rubric and how we score those things. So we all meet after applications are received and go through these together to score them. And then this page, this is the score that you'll be giving. So we need one score from you on each application. Um, you'll see, so we're basically asking you to evaluate the need, priority, and readiness of the applications on a score from zero to 20. These are benchmarks to give you some kind of framework to work with, but you can put 17, you can put 12, you can put three. It doesn't have to be five, 10, 15, or 20. Okay. So is your report already been done? Our report is done, yep, and I'll go through that with you next. Okay. So if you turn the page, you will see your first green score sheet. So that's our first application. If you flip that over, you will see the staff scores on the right-hand side in red. That makes sense for anybody? Okay. And then on the back side, um, we'll have the section that you need to score. Um, the name of the applicant is right there under the table. In case you get lots of who we're scoring when, right there. Um, and you will just mark your score on that back piece of you can circle them, you can write in the numbers at the bottom, whatever you want to do. RAH is something housing. Raw is the recreation and rehabilitation. Yeah, and they provide the um, services to adult people. So that's the score sheet. It's in front of the actual application itself. So we're not going to do that. I'm sorry, I'm just going to sure I see which one. I know how this works. Oh, on that green sheet. Green sheet. Oh, on the right, on the right hand side. <laughs> okay, on the right hand side, regardless of that. <laughs> um, um, so we will um, interview each of the applicants. They have 15 minutes total for their interview. So we tell them to prepare a five to seven minute presentation of the project. 
And then the remainder of that time is for you to ask them questions. Um, Taylor's going to be our timekeeper, so she'll kind of wave everyone down when we have about three minutes left so we know to wrap up. Um, and then when you are done scoring someone, you can pass that score sheet to me and I will enter it into our spreadsheet. You can either score them as you go, you can see the first few and then score them at a break. You can wait to score them until Thursday, however you want to do it. If you want to see all the applicants first, you can. But if you feel decisive, go ahead and pass it to me and I will get the first. That makes sense. And then, yeah, and they are in order of the interviews except for the children's justice center because they can't work. So we'll skip them when we get to it. Questions. And then on Thursday, we'll look at the total scores, um, we'll put them in order of highest scoring, and then you will make recommendations about what to find. And just as kind of said, a reminder that we are currently in open session. You do go to closed session um, for those um, discussion afterwards in case we need to discuss character competence, et cetera. Okay, I think that's all. Okay. Does so, like it? yeah, okay. I think you got it. Okay. Dan, used, our former Dan from Provo used to do that. So we're learning, <laughs> we're learning new things. He is with the state of Utah. So now we have Melissa and Heather, which is awesome. Um, the other thing is, um, depending on your city or if, if it's the Utah County versus the cities, what will happen once we make our recommendations, um, you'll, we'll take these recommendations. So with the city of Orem, we have an advisory commission, um, Ken and Jody, Jody's not here tonight, she'll be here on Thursday. They'll take that back to our commission. And then we will also have some Orem only projects that we will have presentations done during that commission meeting. So then they'll take all of those recommendations to our city council. In Orem, we require two public hearings. So there'll be one in April and one in May. Ken loves presenting to the council. He, this will be his 22nd time or something in the last two years. He actually likes it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and so, and then, and then at that point, at least in Orem, then we will have an approved amount of funds that go on, um, and then we'll do agreements. I think Provo has a similar process, mm -hmm. correct? And then Utah County has a little bit different process where they they don't have public hearings like we do, but yeah. so that's kind of how that all works. So we do have Orem only, Provo only, Utah County only projects that are being considered outside of this group of projects. So these are all public service entities. Um, and then those others will consider government, um, capital projects, um, things that are just public services that are just related to that geographic area. So. And I will, I forgot to mention, so in our total CDBG allocation each year, we can only spend up to 15% on public service activities. And between the three of us, we pitch in Orm and Utah County, pitch in 10% to this regional committee, so it is 12. And what that does is leave a few dollars left so that if our Utah County committee, for example, thinks that a project is really important, but this committee doesn't um, recommend it for funding, that committee could take it back to Utah County and say, we really feel strongly about this one. Um, and so there's a little bit of room in there if you do see a standout project that isn't regionally important, but you think to your particular jurisdiction is important, there is that. Uh, so, so, so everyone tonight is regional or mm -hmm. joint or yeah. 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 And let's see. So just FYI, the, the total amount we have available for public services is 368426 And our total asks were at 617000 Got a little bit of cutting to do. It's always painful. Yeah. The other thing is, um, in the past, this hasn't happened for the last couple of years, but in the past, we've had some capital projects that we have been a, actually funded regionally. We do not have any asks this year for that particular money. So that money will go back into the um, city pots or county pot to be distributed in a different way since we didn't have those projects this year. All of our capital projects have been only based. So most of them Utah County only based projects. 
Um, and the slide is like from our first applicant. She went to the wrong location, so she's on the list. Okay. Do you go to the mad office? Okay. The wrong location. Hopefully, she's not the best. Are all presentations in person or are we going to do slides now? Um, there is one applicant that I'm not sure if they're going to be here in person or on Zoom, but everyone else will be in person. So they up there and mm -hmm. they have a microphone and just talk about Just talk about that way. And they give us a PowerPoint? Um, they can, it's optional. So we have, I think, three that have given us a PowerPoint. Which ones were those guys? Uh, it is Network Community Health Center, Rocky Mountain University. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'll be ready. I'm sure that's true. Yeah. I only had just such a right Oh, you're fine. This is registered. Yes. Oh, she's just cool. Hi. Oh, my. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Are we clear your permission? Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. And you have seven minutes to present. <laughs> and we'll take notes and, and listen intently. And uh, Taylor, okay, is going to do the timekeeping. Go for taking all you. I don't know if she's going to smoke signals or what she's going to do. I'll just wait up. Uh, I don't notice you can yell. <laughs> last few minutes, we'll save the clock. <laughs> I'm Cheryl Adams from McGraw Services. Um, our program specializes in, in programs for adults with intellectual disabilities. And 
I've been here many years and thank you all for the support that we've had over the years. And so I tried to think of some things that you might have questions about and then I would watch them. So first of all, I wanted to um, highlight just some general information. We have the 2020 census that's now available in all that's been three years um, that has new statistics. So I thought I'd share some of those with you. Um, people with disabilities make up these are people with disabilities under the age of 65, make up 6.4% of our population. Now, not all of those individuals would be people that would actually probably participate in our services. However, I do spend a good amount of my time and we spend some of our resources fielding phone calls from people who need other resources that we try and direct them to the help that they need. Um, I'd like to compare that to individuals who are 65 and older that we commonly refer to as seniors which I'm approaching here. <laughs> so I'm wondering about that terminology, but um, so we, and the percentage of individuals who are 65 and older, which also includes people with disabilities who are 65 and older, they group them in the same category, is 7.9%. So if we compare the, the difference between those 6.4%, 7.9, knowing that in the 7.9, we also have all individuals with disabilities who happen to be over age 65, and think about how we as communities look at them and serve them. So um, it is my belief that all human beings uh, deserve every support and opportunity available to other human beings and that we all pay taxes, we all should be, we all contributors, uh, some to more degrees than others. Um, individuals with disabilities live in our community. They, they shop, they, they pay taxes, they, in fact, most of them are rental people, so they sustain us in a different way there. They may not pay property taxes, but they contribute in other ways. Um, they faithfully go shopping. Most of them work in some, some way. Um, those who live with their parents, um, their parents are caregivers, and they, they contribute to the community. Um, and I believe that they should have the same resources. And if we look at that compared to senior centers, most of our cities in Shaw County, devote a good financial um, portion of their um, community-based services to our senior centers, but not one of our Utah County cities that participates in CBDG has a center or a devoted services for people with disabilities. There are services out there that are available to people. Most of them, I will tell you, require that an individual get certified or they get funded through the state of Utah. And right now the waiting list is over 4,500 in the state of Utah. We don't have to break down for that for just Utah County, I'm sorry. But 4,500 individuals are waiting. So people who come to RAW do not need to be state or federally funded. We are actually not affiliated with the state of Utah as far as they don't tell us what to do. People don't have to be funded to come to us. They don't have to go through our criteria. And in fact, as far as taxpayer dollars um, that help fund most of our community-based services, uh, we, we do not receive any state funds. And the only federal connected funds that we receive are community development block grant funds, which are allocated obviously through community um, community partners. So we're not taking any other taxpayer funds to provide these services to these individuals. And in fact, they contribute about 25% of our budget from their own resources. And I'll tell you that almost 100%, but about 98 to 99% of our participants are not only in the poverty range, they're in the very low income range of um, has, um, scale of income. But they contribute to their own program. They contribute to the costs of what it takes to do a certain activity or event. And just like I would contribute if I went to the movies and I paid for a ticket, or if I went to, to a class, I wanted to take an art class, or I wanted to take another class, I would pay a fee. They also contribute to that. So they're, the individuals who come to our services generally are not asking just for everything to be done for them, but they do appreciate some support. We serve individuals with a variety of diagnoses. Um, some of them have only an intellectual disability. Uh, some have multiple disabilities and most uh, some have medical conditions on top of that. 
Uh, our age range right now is in, is people 16 and older, and we do serve senior citizens. We have one individual right now, the oldest person that we're serving is 83, mm -hmm. who is really active, probably more active than I will be when I'm 83. But um, so wide variety of individuals and needs. And I've mentioned this before for those of you who've already served on this committee that one aspect of what we do that is probably different than many other groups that do serve this population is that we are intently um, concerned about parents who have opted to keep their children at home, their adult children at home, and care for them for many years. So we have a lot of aging participants who are getting to be um, 50, 60, 70 years. And some of them are still being cared for by their parents. So um, we, part of our mission is to support the parent, not just the individual, support the family, whoever is caring for this individual, because if that's where they want to live, if the home setting is the best setting for them, we hope to help them be able to stay there. But if any of you've been in a situation where you've been a caregiver or a family member has been a caregiver, doesn't have to be a person with a disability, perhaps a aging parent yourself, uh, your own aging parent, or a family member with a, a serious illness, you are acutely aware that that is a very difficult thing. And it can be quite draining, quite difficult to survive. And I've mentioned it in, in the grant application that statistics show that caregivers have some very serious complications when it comes to health. And the ABLE program that we have designed and um, that your fund, the, the CBG funds help, help us with, are all geared to personal health and wellness. We want the individuals who, to come and attend to be their best, the best they can be, personally healthy. We focus on all areas of health, social, emotional, physical, um, uh, cultural, not cultural, uh, leisure, all the areas you can possibly have. Our main areas are social, emotional, and physical. Those are the, the, are the priorities that we generally focus most of our programs on. Um, and in social, we have personal development, we have learning new skills, behavioral. Um, in physical health, just moving. We try not to use the word exercise too much because some people have had bad experiences in the way people have approached them about health and and they not they don't have a very good self some of them don't have a very good self image people have been um not friendly in the way that they told them that they should change their lives so we encourage movement just keeping your body moving you know doing something to, that you feel better um and then emotional health is really huge um I, when i say that we serve people who are 16 and older that's usually where they're socially between 16 and 18, sometimes not till 21, you know, 22. They're kind of socially ready for these experiences away from family. Um, some of them wait till they graduate from high school or finish, may not be the word graduate. They can graduate with their class, but they are entitled to services through the school district through the age of 22. And um, the one unfortunate aspect of that is uh, they have these services through school and then they turn 22. And if they don't have a, everything right in place where they have a lot of backup, their life just kind of disappears. Even if they have some great friends in school, the truth is, under the, even with the best intentions, those friends are probably going to move away. They're going to go to college. They may serve missions for the LDS church. They may get married. And even if they do keep in touch, their life is not going to be the same. And they're going to see their peers doing things and that they probably will not be able to mirror. Um, some of the saddest phone calls that I have, or that they're sad to me, <laughs> I, I walk away and I have to really regroup afterwards, are parents who call me several years after the children have finished their high school experience and their child has regressed. They're either depressed. They have become completely isolated. They've lost a lot of the skills that they learned because they are just uh, turning inward and not have, there are no opportunities that the parent has been able to find that can keep them active. And these are people who are contributors. They still have much to offer. Is that a signal? 
Well, like three, four minutes left. Oh my goodness, never have that. <laughs> anyway, um, so those are some of the, the things that we're facing. There are so many young people coming out of the school systems, and I'll be honest with you, we have been really strapped following COVID, and I have reduced a little bit of my outreach to the school simply because I know that we're kind of strapped for our resources. But those students are out there and we have more um, young people who are in the special education programs than we've ever had in Utah County. And they're not going to get state funded services unless some sort of critical need happens in their life and they get bumped up to the top of the list and that rarely happens. So what we're going to be seeing every year is more and more young people who are going to be just left with not much. And then a few years later, parents are going to become desperate. And I have, I've given advice that I thought I never would. I've actually told parents to call the police on their own children because they tried everything else and haven't gotten help. And I, I said, this is maybe the most difficult thing you'll ever do. But if there's a police report, maybe they'll finally listen to you that you need help. But this is how dangerous, or this is how desperate you are, you are for help, that your child is doing things to put themselves in danger. It's, it's, it's really, when I, when I finished the call, like I told you, some of these calls are just awful, but what I wanna tell you is that the programs that we offer, on the other side of that, I get to spend my days with people who come and are with their friends. They are treated with respect. They're given opportunities to give back to the community. They have so much to offer. They, we, we don't even, once they start attending law, they have to have some sort of disability to be able to participate. Once they're there, their disability becomes a real non-issue. It's just not even a part of what we do. Occasionally we provide reminders and support if there is an issue, if someone is um, not exhibiting socially appropriate behavior, then we redirect them. My end game and our program's end game is that down the road, we try and look into the future, that they will be equipped with what they need to be successful in their community. And I'm not talking about like Orange City, Provo City, but in their world, that they will be socially confident, that they will have resources in place, that they, they can just continue and have a great life. We want people to have the best life possible. And our motto is, um, we want to make life better, not only for the individual, but for their families. So I have a question before yes. your time's out, but if you want to keep going. Oh, or do you want oh to don't tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> question would help you score better. So okay. if you want to use your time, um, I, have a, I have three questions. I don't okay. want to take all the questions. It's how do you measure success? How do you measure when you've succeeded or how much you've gained by that program? How do you measure? So it can be very tricky in a program like ours. Sometimes it's subjective. We do um, survey parents and caregivers on what their perception is. Like, my child is doing so much better at home. My child is popular. My child is more stable. When it comes to specific programs, if we offer a class, we do an assessment at the beginning. If it's a cooking class, we gauge cooking skills. At the end of the class, we do it again and we see, okay, they now have X cooking skills that they didn't have or they've increased by this, this amount. Yeah, one more question. Uh -huh. um, how do you prioritize those you help if you have X amount of resources and X amount of those who need help? How do you prioritize or how do you evaluate those who you help? We never turn anybody away. I just, I just back off on advertise but once people are um we they come into the program we offer services and some things have limited space so it's just a matter of first come first serve and people pick and choose what they choose to participate in when it comes to you now those are things that people sign up for and register for and they say okay i'd like to do this i want to take this class i want to be here and we just sometimes have to limit the space so the first 25 people that want to take this class are the ones that get in if it's if we have 15 more people that wanted to come, we offer it again. So we try and make it fair 
So everybody gets an opportunity. When it comes to other services, I just answer the phone as much as I can. And I, if I'm on the phone with someone, I just, I just help them as much as I can. So if a parent calls and asks me for advice, I just talk to them. So I never, nobody gets turned away in that respect. I just try and give them as much information as I can and direct them to whatever resources I can. Yeah. So, um, so why why is this year different than the past three years? So COVID, um, we have a little bit of a delay. So the funding delay of the impacts on COVID, some of the donations, we offered all of our services during the entire COVID uh, pandemic. Um, we offered online services. We went to places sometimes. We offered, um, in some cases, we took uh, tablets, technology, and uh, we did get some grants for, for certain ones, but we kept our staff employed and um, we did use grants for some of that, but we didn't charge our participants anything all during that time period. Um, it was very difficult for me to put a price on what online programs, you know, what, what that was. I was more worried about their mental health and their isolation. And, you know, we had a kind of a stash and now that we're back operating and doing full-time services, we're just trying to catch up and get funds back in place and get kind of back on track with our schedule. We've also had a staffing shortage like many organizations in the social services field. Um, the state of Utah last summer, um, for those who had state-funded services, they passed a uh, I don't know what it's called when you pass something and you tell people they can spend more money. It's not really a law or a bill or something. But anyway, they allowed uh, social service providers who are state funded to raise the wages by four dollars an hour for state funded providers. Which uh, for one provider in particular, they had not had one bite. They serve Salt Lake City, Utah County, and St. George, and they had not had one bite in three months. Okay. And that 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 was questions as well. Yes. Okay, sorry. I then I spoke into the question. I'm sorry. <laughs> and then, well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Um, thank you. I appreciate thank you being here and your service. And uh, good luck at the rest of the evening and the rest of your visits. <laughs> I appreciate you very much. Thanks, Cheryl. Thanks, Cheryl. Thanks, Cheryl. Is there there's an ask? Is there uh we don't get the full amount? Yeah. Yeah, that's a little bit more. See. Um, question F, that's three. Okay, I won't take her time. Yeah, it's not fair. And I'll throw that to the one you're on. That's fine. Okay. Welcome to our joint community meeting. We appreciate you joining for today. And I um, want to let you know you have seven minutes for your presentation, and we're going to save a few minutes uh, for questions from us to you. And then Taylor over here is going to keep track of the time for you. So she's making signals to you, and probably time for us. I'll give you a wave at like seven minutes so you know what I mean. And she questions. Yeah, that's great. Steve, when you're ready. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Um, you've taken time to our presentation today. My name is Ashley Taylor and I am the executive director of the Refuge Utah. We serve victims of domestic violence and sexual assault throughout all of Utah County. We are the only domestic violence shelter in all of Utah County um, and as you can imagine have an overwhelming need for domestic violence and sexual assault services in our county. Each year or this past year I should say we served 1,575 victims um, through a variety of services. So that included our domestic violence shelter, which is an emergency shelter for those that are fleeing domestic violence. 
And we also have advocates that are on call 24 seven to answer hotline calls, talk through safety planning, help individuals um, make sure that they know their options as they're looking to get out of an abusive situation. We also have advocates that are on call 24 seven that are able to go to the hospital and help those that have gone through a sexual assault and be there with them during the forensic um, exam, which can be very overwhelming and a lot of information is being thrown at them in that process. So our advocates are there. We send two advocates to each of those calls to be able to be there with them, talk them through um, what they're going through, explain the process to them, and then also give two resources to those that might be there with them in the waiting area. A lot of times family members and loved ones want to be there to support them, but they don't know what they're going through and how they can best do that. We also provide temporary rental assistance to individuals. Um, as I said, we do have our emergency shelter, but unfortunately we have a limited number of beds and we have a much larger need than we have the bed space for. We are able to provide some temporary rental assistance to individuals that can help them either stay in their safe housing or get them into new safe housing. We've had a lot of examples where an abuser may have been arrested and they've been taken to jail so that they're safe in their in their home right now, but that person was the primary drug dealer, And so they aren't able to stay there for long. They've maybe gotten a job, maybe they've, they've come through some different financial things like that, um, but they need a little bit of help for temporary rental assistance to be able to keep that safe housing. Um, that program has done very well and has been a newer program for ours and has um, helped a lot of families that have not had to either turn to homelessness or turn to our domestic violence shelter, but been able to stay in their safe and stable housing and move on past their domestic abuse. We also provide group and individual therapy for anyone that has um, been a victim of domestic violence or sexual assault. And we provide group classes for the um, victims and their support networks that can learn more about domestic violence or sexual assault, what they're going through. And we offer those in both English and Spanish. Um, we also, with our, our sexual assault advocates, we provide follow-up calls. It's a lot of times those that have gone through that abuse, they don't know what they don't know yet, right? They don't know the resources that they're going to need. So a few weeks after that assault, we'll do a follow-up call with them to make sure that they know of resources that are available to the community, um, know of our resources so that they can get help from our classes, to get them signed up through therapy, um, and make sure that they can continue on their healing process. We also have advocates that are able to meet people and talk with them through not only community resources that are available to them, but also the criminal justice process, especially if they've pressed charges or if um, something has happened where law enforcement was involved. That can be a process that is very overwhelming if you don't know, if you've never been through it, right? A lot of lingo gets thrown out, things that they don't understand, um, and our advocates can sit down with them, talk them through the process, explain what some of that means, and help them if they do need some sort of legal advice, help them get connected to those that can provide that legal advice. So our proposal is just for um, some of our general operating costs. Uh, we do get some grant funding that helps some, with some of our specific program funding, um, but we are looking for some help with those overall operating costs to be able to provide these services to all the victims in Utah. Maybe I bought a few minutes back for all of them, but <laughs> I don't know too many so questions. How, how do you work in conjunction with uh, staff yeah. member? That's a grant as well, right. coming from a different source. Mm -hmm. Did we work with them? Yeah, we work very closely with them. So we actually have monthly meetings with all the victim advocates in the county, and we have our advocates attend that as well. Um, we refer or we receive a lot of referrals from those victim advocates. So they usually have a limited amount that they can do with the victims on site, um, and then they can call us for additional resources or refer them to us for additional resources. You know, online. Yes. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a I have a question. Um, in our during COVID, we talked up to about twenty percent more for domestic violence during COVID. Mm -hmm. All these people with each other twenty four seven. My question is: Has it tapered off, or is the need still growing? Or, or it's still growing, not at that rate. So we did see a huge jump um, during COVID of, of the number of calls. We receive about twenty six hundred calls each year to our our hotline. Um, and that has increased, but then has been a steady, steady number since then. Is that increase growing with the population? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so your primary focus is on domestic violence or do you have this other items? 
So domestic violence, sexual assault, we also encompass stalking, anything with interpersonal violence. Um, I'll ask this question. Your applicants or your or the people you help are generally referred to by law enforcement or chicken advocates. Is that correct? Is that um, uh, I'm asking kind of the same question. Sure. Is that correct? Yeah, not all of our victims are. There are a lot of victims that call our hotline because sometimes they don't want to go to law enforcement for whatever reason. Um, we receive a lot of people that are just calling looking for services that may not want to report. Um, they may not be ready to leave. They may be looking for a lot of other resources before they are ready to leave an abusive situation um, and law enforcement are not necessarily involved. We do work closely with the victim advocates and do receive a lot of referrals, but of our overall numbers, I would say probably about 40% are referrals from victim advocates. And where does your process end after the help of what, what's finished for? Um, we consider our approach survivor driven. So when they don't need resources anymore, then we won't provide them. But if they're still looking for help, we will help them as long as they as long as we can. Um, and with things like our emergency shelter, obviously that's temporary. So we help them until they have another situation that they can move into. Um, and we help them set goals, help them apply for housing, whatever it is along the way to get them to the next step. But even once they leave our shelter, they're still eligible to receive aftercare services. So they can still receive individual group therapy, still talk to a case manager, still get some of that help as they're moving in and making themselves more permanent and self-sufficient. How big is your shelter? 25 beds. There are actually Um, So we give them a target date of 30 days. We don't have a very set cutoff date because then we work with each individual as their case needs. Um, some do extend for quite a bit longer, some need shorter, so it really just depends on their situation and needs. Do you want to tell them about your dream? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we are looking to build a new facility because we have we've had uh, 25 beds for almost 25 years now. And obviously the population has almost tripled in that time and our beds have not. Um, unfortunately, we've had to come up with other solutions. Just last year, um, 480 individuals were, it sounds terrible to say, turned away because we were full. We referred them to either other resources or came up with other safety plans for them because our shelter was full. Um, so we are currently in the process of, of working on acquiring some land to build a new facility and to be able to increase that. Can I ask, how do you protect the victims? Like, is everything like an angry person might want to try to revenge on? Yeah. How do you, what, how do you, what's the security in the safety procedure? Yeah, absolutely. That's actually part of the, the request that we put in there is for our security costs. Um, at our shelter, it's all in a gated area. So there's a gate at the front. Um, so anyone that comes in has to call in at a call box. There's video monitoring of all of that. Um, we have had a few issues where people find out where it is um, because we do keep it an undisclosed location and do show up, um, but we do look to work closely with law enforcement and are able to call them and diffuse the situation. So we rely heavily on security systems, cameras over the entire property to make sure everyone knows what's going on on every piece of that property. About six minutes. Well, then I'll ask more questions. <laughs> On, on those you serve, is there a certain, um, I don't want to ask that question, does it cater more to women and children or old, you know, is there a, a population that you, yeah. you serve? Definitely with um, the demographics that we serve, we do see more women than we do men, but we do serve all individuals. In fact, we, a few years, rebranded because we were the Center for Women and Children in Crisis. Um, which discouraged men, obviously, from calling because they didn't think they could receive any services. But we do see men as well. Um, the majority are women and children, especially that stay in our shelter, um, usually because they don't have the financial means to be able to move them to a safe location um, because of often financial abuse and things like that. So they're looking to, to stay in our shelter. Because we have the two large populations of um, the universities in this county and in this area with sexual assaults, are the majority of them are college age.
No other questions, it's still fine. So I, I have assisted some women and the children to the shelter. And most recently, I had a family that turned out the father was an abuser. And I was greatly impressed with what the refuge did for them over a very couple of years, but including them. Um, they, they really, really got the services that they needed. And it was such a joy to see them become smiling, happy, and productive. It's, it's an important resource. That's it's great to hear those you know, the end results. So how how big is your your staff and your how how big of an operation do you do? Yeah, we have 14 full-time staff um, and 15 part-time staff. And then we have over 120 volunteers. And our volunteer force, um, it, it is it, even more impressive because all those volunteers have to receive at least 24 hours of training before they start. Those that are doing our sexual assault advocacy, they receive 40 hours of training before they start. And then all of them receive ongoing training. So these are very dedicated training volunteers that are helping us out. That's, that's great. And it really speaks to the community, right? That we, we have so many that reach out to us that want to be a part of what we do. Um, and they become these, these great dedicated volunteers. Yeah, so the, some of the funding that comes, the agencies that they pass through might be a little bit misleading. Um, funds that are coming directly through the, the Division of Workforce Services, they're kind of funds that are for um, needy families. And so those are rental assistance dollars that we're able to, those that are looking to move into permanent housing, we're able to use those rental assistance. So it just happens to come through their department. So there's lots of refuges in other Palestinian countries. Is that a coincidence or is there any kind of a? Nope, just a coincidence. Yeah, we are just a standalone nonprofit. Which you are kind of associated with child coalition domestic violence. We are, yes. Yeah, we do work with, there are 15 agencies like ours throughout the state that we work closely together. And I recently learned as of last week, you guys were started by United Way. Yes. Mm -hmm. From 1984. Yes. Yeah. I never did that. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> It's a long walk to the front of the room. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Give me like two seconds. Two seconds, okay. It doesn't, you know how Zoom is, it has to be. No, oh, we're so you're ready. Welcome to our joint community today. Appreciate you joining. You bet. Thank you for coming down to us. And uh, we have seven minutes for your presentation, and then we're going to say about five questions that we can for you. Okay. And Taylor over here will be his name. So she throws something at you, you know, you're going over. I guess there are Got some of these if they want. Thank you for ready. Please. Yep. Hi, my name is Todd Bailey, and I'm the executive director for Mount Lands Community Health Center. We're primarily based here in Utah County. We have four different sites here in Utah County, and our mission is to provide health care to those that are born indigent. Um, did you know about one in 11 of us can afford their health care and uh, are under 200% of poverty? About 9% of us in the state are uninsured. 
And we are the organization in this area that is designed to serve those folks that are struggling with their healthcare needs. So I kind of went off script, huh? <laughs> well, just let me know when you want me to move. Okay. Uh, slide two. Um, okay. We, <laughs> we uh, all of our we all of our practitioners are licensed and board certified, and uh, a couple of our practitioners have been with us for over twenty five years. Um, they love the fact that they can help their neighbors with their healthcare needs. Let's I think it's the three. We established in 1992. Um, our original site is uh, no longer there. It, it was where the uh, new convention center is in Provo. So <laughs> we uh, moved from that site into the old health department building that's on State Street, 9th Beach, where they come together across from Provost uh, uh, Elementary there and the cemetery. Uh, we serve over 20,000 patients a year. Um, about 53,000 visits a year, and we slide, which means we discount our, our services in the, in the sum of $64 million, which is huge, which is a, a great uh, thing for our, our community. I Slide uh, four and five kind of illustrate some of our different sites. In slide five, it, it, it shows our co-location with the uh, Food Care Coalition, where we provide services to the homeless and uh, those that experience home homelessness. And for them, the services are actually free. Um, we provide those services for free. Um, on slide six, we talked a little bit about some of the services that we provide. We provide uh, medical, behavioral health, dental care, and we also provide pharmacy services as well. And so our patients, uh, as far as pharmacy goes, can participate with our pharmacy where we can, as the type of entity that we are, we can purchase pharmaceuticals for basically nickels on a dollar and provide those medicines to our, our patients, which saves patients a lot of money. And I've shared this experience before, but we had a BYU student that was insured, but still paying $200 a month in, in diabetic supplies and, and medicines. And with us, he could purchase those same, ph ph same pharmaceuticals for $15. So that's the type of discount that we can provide to our, our patients. In slide seven shows our some fun stats, 20,600 plus patients served last year. 56% of our patients are under 150% of poverty. Uh, we provide discounts down to 200% of poverty or up to 200% of poverty. So that percentage base would jump about 9% more. 55% um, of our patients are uninsured. Um, and uh, quite a few patients are best served in a language other than, than English. Uh, slide uh, eight kind of uh, shows some uh, stats of what we provided last year. Oral exams, 2,400 uh, hypertension uh, patients, about 3,400 patients there. 368 babies delivered last year. Our, our practitioners see the prenatal um, services in our facility, deliver the babies, at Utah Valley, and then they come back to our shop for postpartum post care. So 368 babies. Um, let me see. If we jump to slide nine, um, kind of talks a little bit more uh, targeted about um, the, the services that we provide to this, this uh, uh, committee here. About 79% of our patients come from Provo, Orem, and Utah County. Uh, which is 16,442 patients last year that we, that we provided services to. And uh, to those patients, we wrote off or discount about $51 million. So we help our, our community. We are this community, right? We, we are here to help those that, that we live with. If you look around us, about one in 10 of us could use a medical home because they can't afford one. And that's what we do. We provide a medical home to, to our patients there. We go to slide uh, 10. Sorry, I'm just getting out. I keep it running. So I thought it must have been. So, uh, um, nearly 74% of our patients um, could qualify for the CDG. And um, we're asking for funding to help us provide for those patients. It costs us over $150 per visit to help our, our patients. We charge our patients, particularly those that are in the lowest category, $30, and that includes 
everything that should happen in a video. And I'm talking about sometimes labs exceed that, right? Um, if you go in for a prenatal visit, your first prenatal visit, we're providing over $600 worth of, of labs, right? So it's a huge discount. And what we're asking is for, for the community, the CDG managed to provide about $100 per visit, right? So we're writing off the lifting that we're allowing um, this grant to kind of help them. And so for a handshake between the patient, ourselves, and the community, to help them uh, get better at what they're doing. Last year, we uh, received about just a cry of $42,000 and $43,000, which translates into about four. 128 patients that we filled last year. And this year we're asking you the same that we did last year, which was $50,000. Did I hit my seven minutes? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, are there any questions? Please uh, let me know what, you, what you're thinking at this point. I know that I drew a lot of stats out there, a lot of things, and trying to go quick. But uh, the, the thing that I like most about what we do is, is is when I walk out into our, our um, waiting room, you can see patients that are in pain. And they finally have found a spot where they can be served. Most of our patients, particularly in the dental area, you know, you usually don't go to a dentist and tell you in pain if you can't afford it. So they come to our, our practice, they're in pain. They've got cavities. We do a lot of extractions. We do a lot of root canals. We try to save canals, but when they get to us, Sometimes it's, it's almost too late, but uh, when they're done, they're better off than they were when they started. So, yeah. I think I can answer for you. Yeah, yeah. How, how do you acquire patients? Is it they walk in, or how, how do they get referred to, or how do you get uh, known? Uh, word of mouth. And a couple of years ago, we purchased some advertisement at the uh, um, Provo Town Center movie center. You know, they do in between movies that have those yeah. things like that. And so we started asking our patients, how do you hear about us? And we were thinking, hey, we spent a little bit of money. We should hear, oh, we saw you at the movie. Not a one. Every single one of our patients came to us by word of mouth. So when you're in pain or you're sick like that, and you say, I can't afford to go to a doctor, as soon as you, you tell it to somebody, like, well, have you heard of mountain lions? They can help you out. And so then they come. And that's it. Where we find 100% word of mouth. So how do you measure from year to year your effectiveness of your success or your accomplishments? How do you gauge that? Um, there's a couple ways that we gauge it. One, we like to look at our quality measures. So we have several different quality measures we look at as far as like how many of our patients are controlled diabetic, how many patients are controlled cardiovascular, et cetera. We also want to make, we also measure it by how many slots we have empty, how many slots are not being, mean, sorry, appointment, appointments are left empty. And right now we're, we're running nearly 90% of our plate, our slots are full. And a lot of those are just vaccinations or uh, no shows. So we're running, that, that's some of the measuring sticks that we use to say that we're doing, doing well. Any other volunteer? No. Uh, all of them are um, employed. And it's partly due to our malpractice insurance. We get our malpractice insurance tech, it's a long tell all about basically from the federal government. We're covered under FTCA Federal Post Claim Act. And in order for them to be covered underneath that, they have to be employed. So that's part of that. So we so we're competitive, we have to pay competitively in order to not be employed work for us. Yeah. But that's yeah, they're all um employed. However, we do. Um, donate space, if you will, to the volunteer care clinic. So Tuesday and Thursday nights, we we reduce our footprint in our clinic and and provide about twelve rooms to the food and care coalition or the or volunteer care clinic, so they can um, use the donated space to for their volunteer doctors. And you may do they do they apply for this? Wait, they don't. They don't. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we we have them in that department. I've got a question. So we're fifty percent of the way through prior year award. You have only gone down about fifteen percent of the requirement. Historically, you guys have any problems 
coming down on this weekly front. We anticipate being able to do that on second half of the semester. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we have some change in staff and also uh, to be quite frank with you, the person that really helps with this and motivates our staff to gather the information. We're seeing the patients, we're just not gathering the report part of it. The person that's been in, in charge of that and, and helping with that had twins in October. Oh, okay. And so, <laughs> so and she is really <laughs> sitting right okay. here with me. Yeah, and so okay. now she's back and she's helping getting that going again. So yes, we will definitely see it. Her name's Amanda. Yeah, Amanda. <laughs> she is terrific. She now has three babies under three. So, <laughs> so more power to her. She lost awesome. her. I uh, invite you to please come down and say to yourself what we do there. Our main sites. Yeah, like I mentioned in Provo uh, State Street, but we also have site co located with the Rochester Halo Health. Soon by our East Bay site, which is where we provide care to the homeless, and you'll see how that works there too. So please, uh, the invitations there, stop by and take a look at the team. Just sit in the waiting, in the waiting room and see what happens. It's, it's quite magical. All right. Thanks, well, Todd. Thanks, you guys. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. It was a tough job. Thanks for volunteering. <laughs> so, uh, representing for Big Brother Big Sisters, thanks, Kim. So, all right, I'm here. Ah.
Thank you for coming, Ms. Zanko. Thank you, Tyler. We uh, have seven minutes for your presentation, and then we'll take five minutes. We'll stay five minutes for us to ask any questions that we may have. So it's delightful. Uh, Taylor here will track the time for you. Delightful. Thank you, Tyler. So please begin when you're ready. All right. Um, so, first of all, my name is Nicholas Webster. I'm the grass coordinator for Big Brothers Big Sisters of Utah. We have been very grateful to have the opportunity to work with uh, Orem City uh, through the CDBG grant for the past two years. Uh, during that time, we have in each year, the first year that we worked, is that if y'all, um, sorry, my southern comes through every now and again. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, once you uh, uh, receive that, you just never can get rid of it, to tell you the truth. Um, anyway, uh, the first year that we worked uh, with you, we uh, were fortunate to have 59 uh, mentees that we worked with throughout Utah County. Um, of those, 20% uh, or one in five were actually of minority populations. 37% uh, were female. 86% uh, received subsidized lunches, or at least qualified for subsidized lunch. And um, throughout all of Utah County, 90% of the children and youth that we worked with were uh, low to moderate income youth. So we have had a significant impact on these children's lives. Um, but one side, one last statistic, a 76% or three out of four youths were in non-two-parent households, which means they were either run by a single mother, uh, foster care, say grandparents, things like this. So what we do with our mentorships is we will match these underserved children with caring adult mentors that will help them through the different obstacles that they find in their lives. Um, a lot of these children come from, as you can see, from lower income households, Many of them are actually living below the poverty line. Uh, many of them have witnessed domestic violence. A lot of them, their parents, if uh, both of them are in their families, will move often. And so these children have a very, very difficult time in trying to connect with the community as a whole. They have very li limited family connections as well because of their lifestyles. And these are what have been referred to as adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. And ACEs have been strongly correlated with things like drug use and later life, uh, crim criminality, uh, depression, a number of different factors. What our mentorship programs have been evaluated with numerous studies, and if you're interested in those studies, I can point you in that direction um, after this, have documented statistically significant results in alleviating a lot of these symptoms or and giving these children the opportunity to learn how to develop psychosocial skills that they have not had the opportunity to develop uh, previously. So I am lacking the statistics I wanted to focus on just uh, Some of the uh, statistics, and these weren't the ones that I was looking for in particular, but uh, they are, if you have access to our application, it is on page seven. Now, through the use of Big Brothers Big Sisters of America programs, so we, our program is modeled after. 46% of the students are, or children are less likely to use illegal drugs. 52% uh, are less likely to skip school. 33% are less likely to engage in physical confrontation. So we have an enormous impact on these children's lives. In fact, for the past three years, our statistics show that greater than 90% of the students who were affiliated with the Brothers Big Sisters Utah program have graduated high school and have gone on one of the programs that we emphasize with them is applying for financial aid, learning that process so that they can begin to emerge from the cycle of poverty that they have found themselves in. Uh, let's see if there's any other points that I'm neglecting to mention. Um, 
CBD funding, uh, CBD funding has definitely had an impact on our ability to connect with these students and children and to um, have an impact in their lives. Uh, the first year that we worked with you, we received, we were grateful to receive $10,000. Uh, this last year, um, our amount that we had received was slightly less. It was 8860 And from some recommendations from different people, we have actually requested a $15,000 this year. That $15,000 will allow us the privilege of expanding our programs providing more mentors, more uh, staff time for helping these children with what they need exactly. Um, I'm sure if there are, I mean, that was kind of a brief overview of what we're doing. Uh, I don't know if there are any specific questions you may have. Yeah. How do you want to go that line? We do, uh, we have a lot of different methods to uh, do that. We work very, very closely with a lot of uh, mental health organizations, as well as school counselors. Um, previous people who have been involved with Big Brothers Big Sisters will also provide us recommendations. The majority of our programs are promoted through word of mouth. Uh, we don't. We do not necessarily actively go out and seek these children. But we do work with a lot of different nonprofits and organizations, both governmental and nonprofit, that to identify children that may need our help. And what's your target age? I know by like the age of 12, most of these kids, you know, know what they're going to do and right. where they're going to be. So you target younger kids? Um, we actually, the our upper age limit is 18 years of age. And then a lower age limit, I want to say it's about five or six years old, um, depending on where we are serving. Our, the majority of our students would be our children. Sorry. I, my, I also work as adjunct professor, so I'm used to saying the term <laughs> students. Um, the majority of the youths that we work with will be all different age groups. We have a program in Weber County as well as in Salt Lake County called Mentor 2.0, which targets high school children. Um, and so depending on where we are, we don't have that program here in Yukon County. So the majority of our youth will be, um, in statistics I was looking at earlier this morning, the majority of them are in either below 12, Maybe the upper limit would be product 14 or so. How do you recruit your uh, big brothers and sisters? And if you expand the program, you know, is your problem is getting more mentors? Uh, that actually is one of the biggest obstacles that we have is finding potential mentors. We have uh, numerous female mentors that uh, for our children, but Recruiting male mentors is a wee bit more difficult for us. Um, we have gone through, and we still do actively recruit them through a um, mentor mentor program that we run. Uh, this past year, we paired with different radio stations, getting message out. Especially during the summers, we will go to different festivals and fairs to table at those and try to communicate. What we do, the need that we have, um, we will target also colleges and universities to speak with those students to see who would be interested in that. So we have a lot of different ways in which we try to contact our mentors, but it is probably the largest obstacle that we have for our program. How long of a commitment is for your volunteers? Is it a year? Is it two? Um, it is, we ask for a year commitment. Um, on average, however, they last about two to two and a half years. Um, but yeah, we ask for a minimum of one year. You know, one of the hardest things we do, <clears throat> we have a certain amount of money and we have a certain amount of money. Here's the request. Right. So 
I notice you have a request of 15,000, but you have a minimum. So is it kind of like we're all, it's an all or nothing thing? Or, or? No, no, uh, that was actually something that we worked on uh, today and probably we don't have access to the most recent uh, application. Uh, we we configured that and the minimum that we would be willing to accept just because of the time and staff time involved would be 7,500. Um, Yes, we did uh, modify the application a little bit based on some feedback that we have received. So, how, how do you measure your success in this program when somebody comes in and they, oh, how would you talk graduate or move on? Oh, no, that, that's an excellent question. So, what we do is we have a entrance survey that the youths will take that will just assess different aspects of psychological aspects like just depression with symptoms uh, plans for the future that type of thing and then we will do a follow-up survey every year and measure the results on that we also have what's called a youth outcome development pr uh, proposal that the youths themselves will fill out and that will ask questions about specific goals that they have, what the youth would like to achieve within the next year or two. And so we can use those evaluative metrics to assess how well the youths are progressing through our program, um, what kind of obstacles they're having, uh, how they're developing both psychologically, socially, and if they're achieving goals that they set out to do. One of the interesting things is that a lot of the youths that we work with have experienced a lot of failure in their lives. And as such, they tend to be more cautious in setting goals for themselves. And the fact that they can have a mentor that will help them to achieve these goals, whatever they may be in their lives, uh, has had an enormous effect. It was one young woman whose goal was to join the soccer team uh, at her school. And it, we engage in a lot of work to make sure that the mentor that we are assigned to these children matches their interests. So the mentor that was assigned to her was a soccer athlete in her high school team. And so this mentor worked with this young, young woman, this young girl, to help her excel and become better at soccer so that she could actually join this soccer team. And it was one of the, in the final survey for this mentorship, this young girl, this young woman, uh, mentioned how wonderful it was to actually achieve this goal that she had always fantasized about and how it made her feel like she could achieve so much more in her life if she just put her mind to these projects, these ideas. We have one more minute. How do you find those that need uh, mentors? The, the children that need mentoring? Yes, I do. Okay, so we work with organizations such as Division of Child and Family Services. We work with school counselors um, who can assess what these children's lifestyles are like. Um, we have connections with numerous other nonprofits as well as governmental entities that focus on society and social needs. And so we can have our information for these children that need it. All of our programs are free and open to anyone who needs them. Uh, we don't discriminate according to income or lifestyle or anything like that. So we make certain to have our information public, as public as it can be. Well, as I mentioned earlier, we also will go to different fairs and festivals and throughout 
in the state in order to get our name out there and our mission so that people know who we are, what we do, how to contact us. Do you ever turn anybody away or not? Um, we don't turn them away, but we may have to put them on a waiting list because we don't just don't happen to have a mentor or an ideally suited mentor for that child. So that's the that's the large problem is that if we don't have um, either the funding or the uh, mentors available, our waiting list tends to be longer. And are the mentor mentors that are they all paid or are they all volunteer? No, they are all volunteer. Okay. But we do have a uh, match support specialists, which um, help the help the mentors. Those are paid positions to match support specialists. They will help the mentors and the youths together to achieve their goals to identify any problems that may be uh, that may exist. And if there are any more major problems than uh, very basic kind of psychosocial development, they have the ability to point those mentors and mentees in the right direction to get the services that they need, that they require as well. I have a personal question. Did you have a mentor that helped you in your life? No, I did not. I did not. Um, <laughs> Probably wish you didn't have. Yes, it would have been nice. It would have been nice. I'm sorry, everybody. That was okay. Not a problem. No problem. Um, thank you very, very much for having me here. Um, you should have my contact information. So if you have any more questions, please feel free to email me. Let me know. And um, I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you for having us.
There we go. Yeah. Hello, how are you? Good. We're on the clock. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Not yet? Not yet. Okay. Hey, welcome to our joint committee. Thank you for coming and presenting to us. We appreciate that. Thank you for allowing us to be here. You have seven minutes to prepare like to move. And then hopefully we'll uh, pull up five minutes of questions for you. So that's all we can take that time. Taylor over here will track your time for you. So you can keep on her for your time. How do you progress? When you're ready, please begin. All right. Well, I'm Rick Morris, I'm the Senior Director for the Rockland University Foundation. Uh, we have a core bono clinic, uh, two core bono clinics from the university that we uh, open to the, the public uh, for Utah County. They're, they're um, free of charge to uh, underserved and under, uh, uninsured or underinsured in existence within Utah County. And we've been in existence since 2015. And uh, we've and been getting really good support from all of the agencies that are involved here. We really appreciate it. It's done wonders for, for the clinic, but it has also been a lot of other great services of these uh, This is Chris Lipton, Dr. Dr. Chris Lipton, a former student at Rockland University and now the clinic director uh, for, this, for the community results. And uh, she's been with us for over a year. That's quite a bit. Two and a half months for a while. Um, she also volunteered as a student caller in the CIC. We're going to go through these really quick. So just tell me when you want me to go ahead. Okay. I just want to give you a kind of a brief synopsis, but maybe um, to can... give you a, a, just kind of a, a little oversight as to what we've done this past year at the CRC. We treated 865 patients, almost 5,400 patient treatments, 707 post-COVID patient treatments. We got a, a grant, post-COVID grant uh, last year. Uh, the equivalent of that in Medicaid and services rendered is 535,000. Uh, we have a lot of volunteers from BYU, UBU, and Rocky Mountain University. So we have over, we have over 5,000 volunteer hours. Uh, 54 of our volunteers came from BYU and UBU, 35 from Rocky Mountain University. We had uh, 10 physical therapists uh, from RMU that also volunteered time. And Crystal corrected me, we had three service missionaries last year. I've only got one, but we had three um, that uh, came over there and served the mission service missionaries over at the time. We break it down by city, 247 of the patients were from the city. 235 from Orem, 301 from Utah County, got 40 from Lehigh, which is higher than we've had in the past, so they're starting to count. 42 others were primarily our MS patients. We received some MS patients that come down from Salt Lake County, you know, these into the service because there's really no other than a clinic like that around anywhere that they can get that treatment that they get there. Uh, the mission, I just, I'm not going to go through it too much, but if you can kind of see what our mission is, uh, and basically if, if one of our missions is to serve the, our community through these clinics. Our vision is to improve the quality of life for the underserved in our community and around the world. And uh, so new president of our university says, so why don't we go with those of you? That's the we just, that's the we just. Uh, I'm not going to read all this, but we have these constantly, and I provide these in quarterly reports to all of the agencies here. Uh, but we have testimonials from our patients and, and what, what the kind of treatment they've got, what it's done for them, and as well. And so we do it each month. So and when we do a quarterly report, there's three different months of, of patients. And we can go to the next one. And volunteer, I'll go back. <laughs> Sorry about that. You were fast. Um, Let me. I don't know if you can go back. Okay. Uh, sorry. Now, if you go back, the uh, the volunteer one is just we also have the testimonies of the volunteers at certain one. And you know what it's done for them as far as their vocation, as far as their service to the community, why they love volunteering there. And I haven't run into a volunteer there yet that has it. Absolutely love serving there and being in the clinic. We have a great, a great a crew there and a great staff, and uh, it's all about you know patient, patient health, patient uh, 
putting those patients up and, and making them better. So, anything you want to add? No, we really appreciate the funding you've provided us in the past, and we're excited to continue serving our communities and our patients. I didn't go through that fast, hold on. You've got lots of time for questions. So, yeah. so is it mostly rehabilitation, uh, physical therapy that you're doing, or? Physical therapy uh, is, is our primary area of rehabilitation. We do have some neuro, because we have the MS center there uh, as well. Uh, we, do some, we, we do some other things over there. We have a health and wellness program. Uh, we have uh, our post-COVID program. Post-COVID program. And uh, uh, public forward. Public So. We do quite a few other things there, uh, primarily, most of the time there. Any idea how long, like most of them are they getting two, four, six therapy sessions, or is there an average? Their know? average is around um, a six, you know, five to six, you know, before their discharge. The national average is around 12. So they're getting better, faster at our clinic than, than our national average. Uh, Mountain Heights Family Health Center, which you're all familiar with, is our primary referral source. We get 70% of our referrals from Mountain Health. Yeah. So it's convenient being right there, right next to them for their patients. They've told me that about 60% of their patients need some type of rehabilitation. So uh, it's worked out to be a really, really good partnership. My last question is, are most of your volunteers like pre-med or pre-physical therapy or some sort of thing that they need an hour? Do you have a hard time getting volunteers to come help or because they need it for graduate school? Uh, no, no. Um, what we what we do is you go up and we up to BYU and we, we, we kind of recruit and tell them about what the clinic is through their volunteer program. They have volunteer programs. And we talk to them about what those are. Uh, and we also go to their um, their language uh, courses. So you know we have a lot of Spanish patients uh, uh, that come in to the to the clinic. So we have quite a few volunteers that come in to translate, just to translate to help us in translation uh, from both of those universities. But quite a few of them come because they're in you know PPT or their uh, medical training or whatever. They kind of want to see what it's like. But a lot of our, uh, the students that come there that, that are like that, they volunteer, um, and uh, you know, enrolling in either Rutgers University or another university that offers those kinds of things uh, because of that experience they get there. And uh, every once in a while, and quite often, we hire them like to get hurt. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I'll add that most recently we've also had some patients also after their discharge who want to come back and volunteer and help others just like them. So that's actually been really neat to see them give back now to their own community and helping us with interpretation. Uh, it's been really neat and special to build this connection with patients. Why do you train your volunteers? Yeah. These volunteers are providing services, right? They they they're all supervised by either a physical therapy or a physical therapist, and so they're they're coached in, a, in the training process. This one probably has been a little more unique than I think. So under uh, so we actually have some extensive courses that we provided on campus, which is a learning suite that both BYU, UVU, and RMU use. Um, we have courses specific to the MS group, so how to guard patients, how to take their blood pressure, um, what to be looking for within a PT session, how to communicate patient responses to the physical therapist. We also have an internship that we've put together that goes through the history of physical therapy, rehabilitation, um, how physical therapy fits through the medical model, and even how it fits within how COVID has now affected us. So we've got two very specific modules, and we've actually even rolled out one for Parkinson's as well, which we host at the university, not at the community rehabilitation clinic, because we don't have enough space for what some of our patients with Parkinson's need. The interns are actually credit courses at the university as well. Mm -hmm. So they get credit for them. Yeah, so you serve like a semester, basically? Or? Some of them have been with us quite some time, some even two years. Um, one even three years, that we have 
been going through for education for BYU. Um, most will attend for one or two or even three semesters typically. I'd say the most consistent that we get is with our MS group. Um, with the other um, students who are coming through for language credit or trying to get their patient hours as they apply to nursing school or things like that, they come in for a semester or two and then get applied where they're going and then say goodbye. <laughs> I might add that this is very, this is really a very, very unique point. There's, I, I, I haven't come across another one like it in the country yet. Um, there are other clinics out there that kind of try to do this, but most of them are student run. So, you know, they're still there to make the cross people there. And, and they're not open anywhere near, as we're over, probably over 40 hours a week, you know, five days a week. And so that's what the obviously the volume of patients that we do. And uh, but the other thing, even like the PT clinic that they do for the community, I think it's open in a day and a half. And uh, there's a very good moment for patients going through there, which is kind of really sad because of the size of all that town. Uh, so this is a, a very unusual model, but one we felt that served the community more. That's why we wanted to do it this way. We wanted to, this is how we can get back to the community. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So how does your this month stewarding and training compare with those of service and providing the services you need? Do you have on one more than the other? Do you see funding from doing that, the educational programs? How do you handle both the service and the educational component? Yeah, if I'm understanding your question correctly, correct me if I'm wrong. How do we put the service as well as the education component with our, our new students that we're asking? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So with our so we do have an SL540 course that we pull in some of our RMU students to get to take the course for credit. They learn about um, health disparities and different communities that are more affected by challenges with access to health care. So they actually have their tuition for that course covered by the university. We also receive funding from several other sources um, in various quantities that help us fund our clinic. When in terms of the service, we have some students who come in just to get service. They don't get any university credit. Um, and when we talk about like the education component, we try to pull students in from BYU, UVU, all of our different universities that are present in the clinic and really teach them about the human body or even what we're seeing, not just um, the needs in terms of physical therapy, but I spend a lot of my evenings just coordinating services for patients who don't have access to food, who don't have access to transportation, to housing, um, to any other services in healthcare that they lack. So, I mean, I wish we could hire a social worker to help me with that, because I do spend several hours every evening mm -hmm. just coordinating care and service outside of the big advantage, I believe, is those volunteer students that volunteer there. When they go out into the clinics, they're so far ahead of their you know, other students that come from other universities that you know that just go to the school, get their degree, and then all of a sudden they're thrust into a clinical setting which they're not used to. Here they get this kind of a clinical setting. And not only that, they get a clinical setting of really serving the underserved of their community. And our hopes are, and many of them do this, and, and I know Crystal did this in Long Beach after she graduated, and work with uh, other types of these types of clinics and where they don't, or provide that kind of free service to treat some you know, underserved patients in the clinics that they're associated with. So we carry this value, this idea of serving out of the you know out of the world really. From we do have we started two years ago. We did start a students run program clinic where one of the faculty members comes by a student by students working you know over there, and even our past president now is doing that with EMG courses over there at the clinic and. Uh, and so we had 83 of those students sign up for that student run pro bono clinic, and they were coming two nights a week, so that we were able to, to open up from about five to seven, I think five to seven. So we were opening the evening system with patients that could not come during the day could come in the evening and get treated. 
Now we've been added that we've had several universities reach out to us. How can they also put in a student or pro bono clinic? And even entities that aren't even affiliated with universities who also want to create a pro bono clinic. We've had Arizona, Colorado, a school in Massachusetts, California, Oregon, and that's only been within the last year. So very exciting to see that service is being extended to other communities and not just here within. And where the clinic is getting out of this country. Because you've got a lot of national organizations there. How do you do this? All right, guys. I'm from Sophia. I'm going to know. We've got these that are in the. Um, this presentation. Now, just leave these um, for anybody that I don't have enough for everybody here, I don't think, but anybody that wants one. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I always love when it's in there. That was nice. I was like, okay. Was Karen coming? Are you you're it? Alpha? Well, there's your, just tell me when you want me to switch. I'll move your thing. I'll move the slides. Yeah. Welcome to our joint committee. Thank you for coming to it and presenting. We think that's happening. And now we may have seven minutes for presentation and then we'll take about five minutes for questions. Taylor over here will track the time for you. So she'll let you know how you're doing. Yeah. Okay. We'll have two applications. Oh. So, so we're we'll just... sure. Okay. So forget what I said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. yeah, that's kind of half price. Okay. Price for nine. Okay, perfect. All right, well, thank you. We, uh, we appreciate the opportunity that we have to present ourselves, our organization, as well as the applications that we have, um, applications in, or the projects we have applications in for. Um, we are Community Action Services in Food Bank, and my name is Jessica Miller. I'm the Community Strategies Director. And Community Action Services in Food Bank has been around since 1967. Our emphasis is self reliance. We strive to foster self-reliance in individuals, in families, and in the community. And we do that through a variety of different programs. You may be familiar with our food bank and our food pantries that we have and the food assistance that we provide, but we actually have many more programs. And three of the programs that are up for, that we have applications in for today, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about. Next slide. Um, Part of what we do is we envision vibrant, sustainable communities throughout Utah, Wasatch, and Summit counties where each resident has safe and affordable housing, healthy and life-sustaining food, adequate economic opportunities, and people in their life they can count on. Next slide. Okay, so our first program is our home buyer and financial literacy classes. And we've requested $16,000, which is about 10% of our total uh, fiscal year 2024 budget, and we anticipate serving 240 households. Our home buyer, next slide. So our home, you might have to put there. Okay. <laughs> so our home buyer education <laughs> classes, there's a, is a total of six hours of instruction, and you be offered on a Saturday where families or households can take it for um, in one day, or they can split it up into two evening classes as well. But we um, cover the home buying process about how to manage um, money, qualifying for a mortgage, shopping for a house, um, cook cookies, as well as looking at closing and how to avoid predatory lending and preparing for being a homeowner. And so that they can avoid foreclosure and know the responsibilities that are involved in that and not be surprised by that. Um, the other half of the application. Uh, the other classes that are uh, offered in our financial learning center are our financial one-on-one -on -one coaching classes. And those are available in both English and Spanish. There's four classes, each one is an hour. There's budget, uh, debt, credit, and savings. And so 
we really use this to help um, low and moderate income households to establish that foundation that they'll need to be prepared for future economic opportunities, to to budget, and to learn to save, and to have that preparation and foundation. Uh, next slide. Our next application is for our community gardens. And we have four community gardens in Provo. Two of them are in District 5 in the North Park neighborhood, and two are in District 4, one in the Franklin and one in the South Franklin neighborhoods. Next slide. Here are some uh, pictures. And um, I think these really capture kind of the, the life and the vibrancy that they will bring to the community. Otherwise, these lots are empty or full of weeds. And instead, they're full of, of life, not only the growing plants, but also it helps to um, grow relationships within the neighborhood. And um, if you wouldn't mind clicking on this video, I wanted to show you this quick. Okay, well, um, it was another picture of the garden and in our gardens, we have coolers. And what that allows um, the gardeners to do is when they have extra produce, they can put that, the, those crops or those the fruits and vegetables in there and share with their neighbors. And for those that in the past may not have had a whole lot to share, it's a real empowering moment for them to be able to, to have bounty and to share with others. Last year, we had 86 households participate in our program and they generated 488 pounds of food. And of that, over 100 pounds, they were able to share either with the food bank or with their family and friends. And, um, and so it really not only strengthens individuals in building that self-reliance, but it also strengthens the community and the neighborhood. Next slide. Our last uh, application is for our Circles Initiative. And this program focuses on helping uh, households get out of poverty. And it really focuses on those who are, who are experiencing intergenerational poverty. And the goal of the program is to get them to the 200% poverty level. Historically, we've seen that this takes about 24 to 48 months. And so we anticipate that we will serve about 84 households over the course of fiscal year 2024. 30 of those will be new applicants. We'll have two cohorts of 15 each. And then the others will already be in the program and they'll be working to get out of poverty. Um, and so how we accomplish this is we have 12 weeks of classes where the, uh, the participants will learn financial education, life skills, soft skills that can help them to improve their employment situation. And after the 12 weeks, they become what we call circle leaders and they're matched with allies. And these are mentors that are come from a middle class or higher economic class um, background. And so they will be their friends and provide them with encouragement, connect them with resources and people that may be able to help them um, with the different needs and situations that they encounter as they're trying to improve their situation. And so um, I wanted to show you a little video. And I think that this really shows kind of the power uh, that is there in the program. Open this one more. And if you just let me know when my time is up. And the Adventist Community Center in Provo, people gather for a meal. But the occasion is not church supper. Most of poverty are the people that you see that you would have no idea that they're struggling to find out which bill to pay. It's a weekly evening meeting at the Provo branch of Utah Circles. These are folks who work together to reach a goal, getting out of poverty. We've been married for about 11 and a half years, and we've been below the poverty line for 10 of that. We have... Um, Moments where we were both unemployed, we got evicted from apartments because of that. In nine years, we moved 10 times, uh, just between living with relatives and, and trying to find a place of our own. It was it was rough, especially with little ones. It was just a survival mode day to day, and, and we just didn't know how to get out of it. There's no way you can get out of the red cycle or... Um, with the building, how do you how do you get that train to take the family to just one another? How do you how do you when it ever get enough to retire? Nothing distracts from the object of every meeting, making and following up on individual plans to get out of poverty. There are two groups of people here: circle leaders, those working to improve their financial situations, and community volunteers who have agreed to become the circle leaders' friends and allies. People who 
struggle in poverty tend to um, become more and more isolated and their social capital is down and it's a downward spiral. So the idea of circles is to reverse that. We tell our circle leaders, our clients, okay, you are directing your path. You get to move forward how you want and how you decide because you know yourself best. So their circle is their circle leader, their allies, me as the coach and outside community resources. Those who have met the requirements to become a circle leader have a stable housing situation and no medical or mental health issues that would block their progress. They learn about goal setting. They work on defining the path out of poverty and they are matched with the allies that will support them in their journey. I jumped ahead and how hard time breaking things down and explaining what it is I have going on in my mind. So he helped me, he helps me break that down so I can take those small steps rather than okay, here's the big jump that I have to take. You're not their coach. You don't know more than they do in the sense of their situation and how to get out of it. You're we're just teaming you and you help them as you help your Circles can be an opportunity to join family to family in pursuit of a better life for both, as is the case with Anthony and Sherry working with Jim and Kim. It's been a huge booster having friends. We've had some down moments the last few months, and having somebody that we can call or text or just to say, hey, I, I'm, I need somebody, and they're there. It's fun to be in our world because we advocate and suggest at the end of the day we're just there to say you can do this you know what's your they folks take their own goals yeah but and they just imagine and say well uh tell you what let's let's hold on a bit longer and see what else turns down the road because uh something something good will always come along we just have to have the patience to uh and the the fortitude to recognize that everything we've done we we're not allowed in the service program to give money. We're not allowed. So all we're doing is giving encouragement, support, and connecting them with, with people that we that, that they don't know that they should know. We hooked them up with uh, Rachel, who hooked them up with a friend, who got Anthony some help he needed at school. I've seen certain leaders go from not having no hope who actually saying, I think I can do this. I've seen people decrease their uh, public assistance by 50% within six months. That's amazing. And the shared journey to leave poverty behind requires both heart and mind. Listening to their personal struggles is part of it because if, if they're in such a place where, you know, you can't even think from day to day of how am I going to get through this? How am I going to get through the divorce? Or how am I going to help my child? Um, we'll store it now when I need to find a second job or how can I take him to the doctor when now I'm working and just <laughs> kind of talking about those things really can help them find focus. If she helped me more, like she said, more than in just looking for a job or having me plan a budget and working with my family and trying to figure out how to do that. Um, she's been a friend. And just listen to the, the struggles of raising kids and uh, all that you go through. I'm a big believer in the idea that the communities are as strong as we're willing to invest in them. And so people have a lot to give. And there are strong members of the community and weaker members. And as the strong share their strengths with the weaker, it raises the whole community. It makes it stronger. It's the kind of program I like because there's it's not a silver bullet. They're saying this is going to take years and years to accomplish. And to me, that's that I mean, that's the kind of thing I like to invest in because it's real. There's, there's nothing, there's no magic about this. There's no, you know, this isn't one of those we're gonna get rid of quick schemes. In fact, it's the opposite. It's, this is gonna be a long slog out of poverty. And that's really what it takes. It's not changing all of Provo. I can't go, you know, I can't brag about anything I've done, but I have, can say that I have touched, I have been touched by one person and one person hopefully been touched by me. Well, thank you once again for your time. Um, we are very grateful for the support that we received through the community. Uh, sorry. Uh,
We're going to rhyme. Sorry. <laughs> uh, and if you do have any questions, I, I will see my deck. We have plenty of time. Like 15 minutes. I have 15 minutes left. Uh, because we did a 15. Oh, oh for the QA. Yeah, okay, okay, gotcha. <laughs> so the, the guy said it takes years to this program to take shea butter. What is the average? Um, well, it's typically 24 to 48 months. And so every year, like we anticipate in fiscal year 2024, that we will have six or seven graduates to leave the program, which means that they will have achieved that 200% poverty level. But it won't be the same people that are starting in the program this year because they will need that need that time to sort through their different situations and to get the education and find a different employment or whatever the case may be to work their way out of poverty. But we do into because we do start cohorts twice a year, we do have um, people all throughout the process. And so we do anticipate that there will be graduates this year from the program. How do you find your clients? <laughs> their own question, but anyway, how do you how do you attract those who participate in the program? Uh, for which of the programs? The the self help for circles. circles? Yeah. Um, well, some of them we find through our programs. They may come for food. They may come for other um, services, whether that's rental assistance, mortgage assistance. It it varies. So some of them are in house, and then we do go through a screening process with them. Uh, to make sure that they don't have any mental health needs or or other things that would keep them from being able to work through the process. Um, we also have partners, um, different community partners that we work with, and we have um, we do advertise for the program as well. We do have a, a website and we have uh, social media and we have newsletters that go out. And so it may be from allies and from past um participants as well their word of mouth has been great in getting more clients and so we do have had a uh, steady um full classes this past year we also teamed up with um my hometown which has been working down in the franklin neighborhood and we have been providing a class through my hometown and so we've been working with them to also improve participants so I wrote my questions down all in one field. So I'm going to jump. Okay. Or I'm sorry. I didn't. No, you're fine. So how many acres is in your you do your garden? How much ground or acres or garden? You know, I don't know how many acres there are. I do know that we do have 93 individual plots, and then we have eight larger plots, which are probably the larger part plots are probably um, kind of an eight by eight size. And so in our communal communal garden on those bigger plots, then those that have more experience can often uh, join forces with those with new gardeners and they go through the whole process together as well as the harvesting and they share their the bounty. And so that's the distinction about our communal gardens, which is down in our South Franklin neighborhood. And then the other three, they're more individual size plot plots. So on your first one, which is home education. Yes, home buyer and financial literacy. Said serve about 84 households, 30 new each year. That correct? Well, actually, our home buyer education, we're anticipating to serve 240 households with that program. So, with the circles per program, per year, per year, with the circles program, we anticipate that we're going to be helping 84 households during the course of the year, and 30 of those would be new households that would start this year. And then in your service, this is really important. In your uh, what you do, are you mostly? Um, I, I got it really down about it's mostly just donation of time for education, more than of goods or money or help. It's mostly donation of education and time. That for the circle program. Yeah. Yes, there definitely is education piece. There's um, the time piece for the volunteers. We also get donations from the community because we do serve dinner each week for the families. And so we have those that those meals donated. 
And then we have childcare so that while the adults are having their classes, there's childcare and they're also learning lessons um, to help them learn to set goals. And we get volunteers from the university typically uh, that help us with childcare each week for that program. So it really is a great way to bring community together because there are so many opportunities for volunteering. And then, did you want me to answer that same question for the other programs? Yeah, but I yes, but I, I write them down together. I just, okay, yes. that's fine. And so, in our home buyer education program, we team up. Um, we we get donations from other um, entities, and we, there's a lot of the community reinvestment funds that also help support the program. And so, we may have banks or real estate agents, those that are in um, home financing. They often may come in little um, small lessons and lend their expertise to just expand the knowledge base that's there for the participants for a home buying um, education class. And then the community gardens is another opportunity where there's um, volunteer opportunities that um, groups can go in and they can help with, with weeding and upkeep. And um, that one really is, we do also have donations that especially when the gardens are new or when there are specific projects that need, um, need to take place within the gardens, we'll get donations from uh, different hardware stores or landscaping groups to help provide, you know, when it's available, those resources and, and supplies that we need. Is there a criteria for those who take their education courses and is there a criteria for accept? Or not. For, the, for the home buyer in the financial, yeah. um, it's it's really available to anyone who um, would like to participate. We do have it as a criteria when when individuals come to us and they are in need of like rental assistance or mortgage assistance or utility assistance. We put together an action plan with them, and one of the action the items on that action plan is often to participate in the first uh, one of our financial literacy classes, that budgeting class. Because our hope is that with education, they will be able to make decisions within their budget that will allow them to become more self-reliant and not dependent on the, the assistance long-term. Um, we also have a save-up club that we have partnered up with others in the community. And so after the, when they go to this first class, they hear about our save-up club. And in our save-up club, if they go to all four classes, they submit a tax return and they show evidence that they've saved at least $25 for each month for six months, then they can receive a cash reward to go towards that nest egg of $250,000. And so that is another way that we really strive to, um, you know, help people apply these principles that they're learning and to get excited about how budgeting and saving can really help them get one step closer to where they want to get to. Um, and so that that resource is available to anyone who comes to us and and um, but because of those who do come to us, the clients that typically come to us, it is very much centered around low and moderate income households that are receiving that benefit. A lot of the housing programs in the community require, like I used to run Habitat for Humanity, we required our families to take financial and home buyer education as part of their qualification for the program. We do the same thing in Provo City with our down payment assistance programs. I do like the attitude of teaching the fish how to get the fish. You know, that's kind of the, the thing. Yes, that's what we really strive to do with all of our programs is to not just have it be, uh, a, you know, like you're saying, a fish, but to really have the opportunity and the services there so that they can can start from where they are and whether that's them, you know, being homeless or wanting to meeting uh, rental assistance or wanting to find a better job or to get resources to go back to school or to buy a home. Um, between the different services that we provide, we really try to help them take this one step at a time to help them get there. questions well thank you very much i appreciate this coming and um you know we look forward to uh hearing your, your decision and um hope you have a wonderful night thank you
Okay, so if I could have someone make a motion to go into closed session. Okay, a second. Okay. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay. So I'll be <laughs> on the agenda. <laughs> so Melissa just needs to tell you one thing. Um, um the, so the community garden that she pitched is a Provo project. So we'll have her come and pitch again to Provo. Right. You can come. You can come to our meeting too if you want. Like. <laughs> so, does anyone have any concerns, additional questions about any of these entities? We're all fairly familiar with them, um, so we can answer those questions. So, so everyone here making a decision is a probably obvious question related employees or gives them like everything's everybody on this has uh, a direct relationship. Oh, conflict. Yeah. We do have a conflict of interest form that we forgot to bring. Bring You can send his, but. Ah, <laughs> So I can hear about these programs from my neighbors. They can tell each other about them. See what else is on our agenda for the night. For Thursday at 4 So, um, yeah, so any for the next meeting, it will just be very similar in nature, but at the end, we will look at the scores. Uh, Jessica will put those up on the screen. We'll look at the scores, and then the hard part begins cutting the funding we do the final. after the final. So we have, it looks like we have seven, eight, eight presentations on Thursday. So. Any other questions, concerns after dinner minutes, as my friend says? <laughs> if you have something you want me to report, feel free to share. If not, um, you can take your book at some if you'd like, but you must bring it back up. I do leave my But otherwise, you will <laughs> take care of the words. Do we need a motion to adjourn? Yeah. Okay. Can we get a motion to adjourn? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Second. Look at me. I'm, I'm like, who's my second there? <laughs> He's usually the <laughs> all in favor. All right. Thank you very much. Is there anything that else you need from us that we didn't provide to you? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for dinner. Oh, you're welcome. Hey. Nancy.